Amen. Thank you so much. Listen, if you're a guest of ours, we've been going verse by verse through the book of James. So let me invite you to open it with me this morning to James chapter 4. And as you open up your Bibles, let me ask you... Did you get a chance to watch any football yesterday? Yes or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did y'all see the LSU miracle yesterday evening? Easy, brother. Calm down. It's pretty amazing. You know, I, I don't have necessarily one particular team that I root for, like, full on. I, I just kind of like to channel surf and see what games are good, and I kind of pay attention to those. But I know James is a huge Alabama fan, and Randy... Y'all calm down. Randy is a cool Auburn fan. And man, somehow or another they get along, right? But uh, so glad that you guys are here, you sports fans. Hopefully you love Jesus as well. But uh, I'm just kidding. But what's unique, though, and what I like is to see a team actually work together as a team. Matter of fact, I enjoy listening to the coaches as they're interviewed before the game, during the game, and after the game. And they're always talking about how the members of the team have to sacrifice themselves for the good of the team to be effective. You know, it reminds me, you and I as a church body, we really are a team. And we've been given this great mission to go and make disciples everywhere. And if we're going to be efficient and effective in doing just what Jesus has called us to do, then we also have to walk together in unity and in love. Now, as you look at the New Testament, you and I have the opportunity to read where Jesus was praying to God the Father in John's gospel. And in that gospel, it's pretty unique because we kind of listen in to his prayer. Listen to what Jesus is praying for you and I, the church. He says, I do not ask on these alone, speaking about his own disciples there, but for those who will believe in me through their word. And that's us. So now Jesus is praying for us. He's praying that they may all be one. Then listen to this. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. Jesus is talking to God the Father and he's praying for us. And he is praying that you and I would be unified so that an unbelieving world might be able to see us and know we've been sent by God. But did you listen to how tight he wants the unity of the body to be? Jesus said, Father, just as you are in me and I in you, I pray that they are in us. Now listen, you cannot get any tighter in unity than the Trinity. And yet the Lord Jesus prays that that's the kind of experience that we will have together as a church body. The psalmist says in Psalm chapter 133, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. And so we know Jesus prayed that we would be unified. The psalmist says there is great joy in unity. But whenever we open up our Bibles to the book of James, James is writing to a congregation that is not experiencing that unity. They are not walking in line with Jesus' prayer, nor are they walking in line with the great blessing that is promised in the book of Psalm. Matter of fact, in James chapter 4, we know that they are committing spiritual adultery, James says. They are cheating on the Lord God. And as a result, they are fighting among one another in the body of Christ. And so last week as we saw together, James really challenges them that they would repent of their sin, cleanse their hands, and they would humble themselves before the Lord. And whenever he says that, he's saying, humble yourselves in the presence of God and the Lord himself will lift you up. So last week we were challenged from the scripture to make sure that we got low and we humbled ourselves. Now listen, humility is a Christian virtue whereby we do not overestimate our personal importance. It is a Christian virtue whereby we do not overestimate our personal importance. And so James now is challenging you and I to live humble lives. Now, here's the question that James is going to answer this morning. How do you know if you've really gotten low? How do you know if you are really walking in humility? How do you know if you have really humbled yourself before the Lord? And so this morning we're going to see from the text two major ways that you can know whether or not you've gotten low. So James chapter 4 beginning in verse 11. You got it there? Say amen. And uh, let me invite you to stand with me in honor of God's word today. And isn't it great we can get together and read the Bible? I, I kind of dig that. You know what I'm saying? It's like the Lord wrote us a book and we all get together and read it. It's crazy. Verse 11, 
Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, today and tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that vanishes for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Let's bow together. Father, we are so thankful for your divine word. And we pray in the name of Jesus that we as a fellowship will continue to walk together in unity. And God, we pray against the enemy who would love to come and seek and to destroy and to divide. But Lord, as we focus upon you, as we rally around the mission of making disciples, Lord, we pray that you would continue to bring people into the kingdom. And God, we thank you for last hour where the three individuals were baptized because they have placed their faith in you. And God, we're trusting that you'll continue to draw people to yourself even this morning and change their lives. Give them a story about you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And everybody said, amen. Go ahead and be seated this morning. How can you know if you've gotten low? How can you know if you really have experienced humility? Two ways according to this text. First of all, when I am humble, I will not smear other people. Now, when I'm humble, I will not smear other people. Look again at your Bible. James chapter 4, verse 11. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but you are a judge of it. Now, right here in these verses, we have three times the phrase, speak against. It's the idea, literally, of mauling or slandering or smearing someone's name. And that was very common to those that James was writing to. You can imagine they would get together and in their fights and in their quarrels, an individual would raise up someone in the body of Christ and they would take their name and run it through the mud and then encourage everybody to come and see what was wrong. Matter of fact, one commentator notes it like this, how sad it is. They were brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, members of the same body, and they were turning on one another. It was like the body attacking itself. So they were a group of people that were very quick to be disagreeable, dragging one another's name into the mud. Speaking against also gives the idea that they were speaking loudly against. So it wasn't necessarily some whispers in the hallway. These were voices that were boisterous in the fellowship. And they would speak out against another brother or sister. They would do it in such a way as to condemn that person. They would do it in such a way as to elevate themselves and ostracize someone else. Matter of fact, uh, the book of Proverbs says, A worthless man digs up evil while his words are like scorching fire. A perverse man spreads strife and a slanderer separates intimate friends. That's what we had going on in the church that James is writing to. They were slandering one another and they were separating intimate friends. Now this is where we've got to closely look into our own hearts. Uh, You and I have the great privilege of walking together in unity as a body of the Lord Jesus Christ. However... Whenever we allow pride to begin to take over our hearts, we will be very quick to actually judge and speak out against others around us. Now, I found this to be true in my life personally. When my heart's filled with pride and not humility, I'm very quick to find fault in others around me. In fact, I'm appalled at how quickly I can begin to point out what's wrong with everyone else and put myself on an island of negativity. And whenever this occurs in our lives and we begin to smear other people, we are actually acting as if we know the motivations and the intentions of the heart of the person we're smearing. We actually are putting into practice our own perceived omniscience. In other words, we think we know everything about everybody, and so now we raise up these people and we smear them. 
Whenever we act in this way, we are acting really like we're God. And we're so elevating ourselves above those individuals that we are acting not only like we're the Lord, but acting as if we are superior to the very people that we are smearing. Now you think about that this morning. Everybody look at me eyeball to eyeball. Whenever you rag somebody in the body of Christ, whenever you smear them, you talk junk about them, you are raising yourself above them and you are looking down on them. But also this text tells us that we're not only raising ourselves above another person, but check this out, we begin to raise ourselves above the very law of God. In fact, the scripture tells us that quite uh, clearly there that we speak against the law whenever we speak against a brother. Now, I boss, the question is what law are we speaking against? And here's the law. We're speaking against the law of love, the law of liberty. James has already magnified that law. That is the law that encourages you and I to love our neighbors as ourselves. So we have that law as followers of Jesus. But whenever we smear someone in the body of Christ, we are not loving our neighbor as ourselves. What we are doing then is we are not only looking down on our neighbor, but we are becoming judges of the law which Jesus gave. Now, tomorrow morning I'm going to take my kids to school, right? So I carry them to Walker Mountain Multiple Intelligences Center. And I drop them off in the morning pretty early. And whenever you drive into a school zone, you know there's always the flashing lights. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And it tells you you need to slow down. There's a new rule at play. Now, can you imagine if I saw the flashing lights headed to Walker Mountain and on my way, I saw 35 miles an hour and I thought, there's no way in the world. I've got to go faster than that. Who came up with that idea? And so I speed through that zone going 75 miles an hour. Y'all with me? Say amen. Shouldn't be with me on that. Just thought I'd test you. But let's just say I did that. Here's what I would be doing. If I sped through that speed zone, 75 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone, what I would be doing is not submitting to the law. Now watch this. And I would be saying, whoever came up with that idea didn't know what they were talking about. I know better. Y'all follow me say yes? So whenever I smear someone, you know what I'm doing? I'm speeding through the school zone. And what I'm doing is saying, whoever came up with that law didn't know what they were talking about. I know better. See, whenever we smear somebody in the body of Christ, we talk junk about them, we are elevating ourselves above the person to ostracize that individual, and we are also elevating ourselves above the very law of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're saying we think we know better than Jesus, so we'll just keep living like this. It's pretty strong, isn't it? Look at verse 12. The Bible says there's only one lawgiver and judge. uh, The one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Now here's the strong uh, statement from James. Here's what he's getting at. He is saying to those who are smearing others. He's saying it like this. It is God's business to save and it is God's business to destroy, not yours. Just as we're standing on the foundation of God's mercy toward us who have broken the law. And isn't that true? I want you to think about this, all right? You and I have broken God's law, and we deserve a punishment for that. Ultimately, we deserve hell. Listen, if God really gave us all what we deserve, we'd all be sitting in hell this morning. Because that's what we deserve. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's holy standard. God is perfect. God is righteous. We are imperfect. We are unrighteous. We deserve to be separated from God. But God showed us great mercy in His Son, Jesus. Did He not? Jesus came. He lived a sinless life. He went to the cross and died there for us. Jesus was buried and resurrected. And whenever we place our faith in Jesus, in that moment we receive mercy from God the Father. So all of us who know Jesus Christ personally, check this out, we have received an abundance amount of mercy, grace, and compassion from God. Wouldn't you agree with that? Say amen. So that's the foundation we stand upon. We're not going to heaven because we're good. We're not praying because we're just religious. We we know God. We've received mercy. We've received grace. And if we have received that amount of grace, that amount of mercy, should we not express that towards others in the body of Christ? Should we not love one another? Should we not make sure, eyes open, 
sober-minded that we don't fall into the category of someone who is smearing others in the body of Christ. There's one judge, and it is not you. It's God. So we've got to be very careful that we don't fall into that category. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you find yourself smearing other people? Do you speak against people who are in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ? Think about that. Are you, listen, some of you, you come to church and I'm fired up that you're here. You're going to get in your car and you're going to drive home. Have you ever had this happen before? On the way home, you start talking junk about people you were in church with that morning. (laughs) Come on now. When we do that, we are not submitting to the law of love. We are smearing people. And guess what? It doesn't honor the Lord. And listen, it totally divides churches too. And I'm so thankful for what God's doing here. But eyes open here at Concord. Uh, all right? Emergency lights blinking right now, flashing. The enemy wants to seek, to steal, to kill, and destroy. So the enemy would love to get somebody in this body angry at somebody maybe over here on this side or maybe over this side and you begin to talk junk about each other and then before you know it there's this chaos going on where smearing is happening lines are drawn in the sand whose side are you on? All of that is not from the Lord that is from hell. So we've got to be very careful that we don't get caught up in smearing other people and we're, we're genuinely humble. Listen, when we've really gotten low before the Lord, the Bible says He will exalt us. So whenever you humble yourself before God, you make yourself right before the Lord, you will be exalted by God and He will fill you with His Holy Spirit and when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will begin to express overwhelming love towards those in the body of Christ and others. Listen, it comes from the Lord. So if you've gotten low, you'll love. But if you're not low, you'll smear people. Y'all out there say yes. All right, so let's go a step further. It almost seems a little out of kilter with where James is going, but you're going to find it fits very well. Whenever I'm humble, I won't smear other people. But then secondly, whenever I'm humble, check this out, I won't plan without God. I will not plan without God. Look at verse 13 in your Bible. Come now, you who say... Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Now James utilizes that phrase, come now. Uh, That's the idea of pay attention, uh, come here, listen up. And uh, James gets personal. James says, listen up, you guys, especially you merchants, you businessmen who are out there making all of your plans to make all of this money and you're not considering God. He pulls them in immediately. He says, you need to pay attention to what I'm about to say. I want you to think about this, all right? If you and I plan without consideration of God, are y'all listening and say yes? Look at me eyeball to eyeball. We are living as if God does not exist. Now think about this, all right? You, You know what an atheist is, right? An atheist is a person who doesn't believe in God. So an atheist just lives their life as if God doesn't exist. So is it not true, even as a believer, when I began to make plans without any consideration to God's will for my life, without any consideration to God's plan, His purpose, and His pleasure for my life, when I plan without God, I'm living the life of a practical atheist. I'm living like He doesn't exist. And listen, if God only comes to your mind on Sundays, you got a problem. So we plan... With God's will in mind, God's purpose. Listen, we don't live self-centered lives as believers. We have been bought by God the Father. He now has a plan and a purpose for us, our life, and we submit to His plan. We walk in line with what He called us to do. Now think about parents. You know, parents today, including ourselves, Krista and I, we, you know, we often have this desire and are very tempted to place as a priority in our life to make sure our kids have the best education, have the best clothes, has the, uh, all the best friends, has all the best opportunity to play sports and all the best opportunity to graduate and go to a good college and a, a good chance to be successful. And we have these plans, but if we're not careful, we never sit back and say, what does God want for my kid? What does God desire for my kid? What does God desire for me as a parent? 
Notice verse 14. He lays it out like this. You don't even know what your life will be like tomorrow. Now, this is a reminder that we don't even have a clue about what's going to happen to us tomorrow. How can we boastfully speak of our plans without consideration of God when we don't control tomorrow? It's a reminder of the brevity of life. Proverbs 27 and 1, don't boast about tomorrow for you don't know what a day may bring forth. James continues in verse 14, you're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. This is encouragement to you and I to make sure that we are submitting to the sovereign God who is in absolute control. Now, check it out. Mondays, you know what I plan to do on Mondays? Every Monday. I plan to study so I can be prepared to preach next Sunday. Y'all with me say yes? Now, here's the deal. Bottom line is, that's what I'm planning on doing tomorrow. I got it down on my calendar. But can I get honest with you? I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I become extremely arrogant if I begin to brag about all my plans. But I don't say, if the Lord wills. And that's what James says. Look at verse 15. He's like, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. So the humble in heart live with God's plan in mind. There's no boasting about personal plans, but a constant trust in God's purposes and his pleasures. And James here is not against planning, but he is objecting to an attitude toward the future that takes no account of God. So we must be very careful. As one commentator says, we must live each day with the awareness of our mortality and thus of our total dependence on God for all things. Listen, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but check this out, but we do know who holds tomorrow. And so we should, in that, fully trust in Him. So even as you sit down, sir and ma'am, and your business, and you're planning out weeks ahead and months ahead and years ahead, would you pray, oh God, if this is what you will, make it happen. If this is not what you will, make your will so clear to me. I ultimately want to submit to your plan, not mine. Amen on that. Now, we go a step further here and think about what the psalmist said. Psalm 39 Check this out. Are y'all listening and say yes? This is an awesome verse. Listen to this. Lord, make me know my end and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. Behold, you have made my days as hand breaths. You know what a hand breath is? Here it is. That's a hand breath. He said, that's how you've made my days. Like a hand breath and my lifetime as nothing in your sight. And then he says it like this. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. No, what you think about it? Listen, let's kind of do a little exercise. Y'all with me say, yeah? A little exercise. We're going to do a little breathe in, breathe out. Inhale, exhale. All right? So I'm going to count to three. You inhale. When I say let it go, you let it go. All right? And uh, your neighbor's breath's going to stink. Y'all with me on this? But let's just do it anyway. All right? So here we are on the count of three. On the count of three, you inhale. One, two, three, inhale. There it is. Now exhale. Blow that thing out. That's how long your life is from God's perspective. One breath. Now think about this, all right? If all you have is one, don't you want that breath to be giving glory to God? Don't you want that brevity to be honoring the Lord Jesus Christ? Listen, listen. If the Lord shows up today, you sure you want to be out there smearing somebody? If the Lord shows up today, you sure you want to be making plans without considering God's plan for you? You know, I remember growing up, you know, my parents would leave me and my sister at the house uh, by herself uh, for weeks on end. No, I'm just kidding, but just for a little while. And um, while we were there, you know, as soon as they left, man, like we'd start picking on each other before, you know, we start, you know, arguing with each other, fighting, hollering at each other, throwing things, you know, and slamming doors. And typically she was the one doing all this, but I was just there. And so all of this was happening. But then as soon as my parents would drive up on the driveway, we put it all down. We love each other. We sitting in there watching movies. You know what I'm saying? Hey, mama. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? But you and I are to live every single day as if the Lord's coming for us. And when we live in light of that, we won't be caught up in a bunch of nonsense. We'll be caught up in the rat race of this culture. We will be sold out to what the Lord has called us to do. He says here, boasting in your arrogance, verse 16, 
All boasting is evil. Planning without any consideration of God is evil. It's a word that literally speaks of uh, being sick and perverted of mind. Think about that. When you plan without thinking about God's plan for your life, what He wants to do in you and through you, when you just make plans willy-nilly without any consideration of the Lord, that is perverted thinking. And what James, and I, and I love the Bible, right? When you get around God's Word, God's Word is here to renew your mind. So whenever you're kind of perverted in your thinking or warped in your thinking, God's Word helps you think right. So let me ask you, when was the last time you made plans in light of God's plan? When was the last time you said, Lord, what, what do you desire for me? Where are you leading? What would you like? And then he lays it out here in verse 17 to kind of close us off. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Now, everybody listening and say yes. Don't put your stuff up. I want you to listen to this, all right? If you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, it is sin. So That's what James said. So check this out. You know the right thing is to humble yourself before the Lord. That's a command of God. So if you choose to continue to walk in pride and not humble yourself, then you're walking in sin. And here's what's amazing. God says he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Could you imagine if you were living your life filled with yourself and God opposed you? (laughs) Y'all with me on this? I I was talking with somebody one time and sharing the gospel with him. This is what long ago. It was right here in the foyer of the church. And so I was sharing Jesus with him. And while I shared with him, he said, well, me and the Lord, we got a few things we got to work out first. You know, I've been talking to the Lord. I said, hey, man, guess what? He going to win. I mean, I don't know what you think you got going on. You can't handle the Lord. <laughs> Y'all all right? Nobody, that's why nobody talks to me anymore in the foyer. Like, don't mess with that dude right here. He's crazy. Crazy than it is. This is it. Whenever you live as if God doesn't exist, you're living with such a big head. You and I both. We got to be very careful. We're going to submit to him. Low, get low, get low. Now, here's the deal, too. If we know we shouldn't plan without considering the Lord, and we plan anyway, sin. It don't get any clearer than this. Y'all like James, don't you? Y'all like James, don't you? He just lays it out there, clear as crystal. So I'm encourage you. Two things, all right? Your two challenges this week. This is your take home, all right? So what I want you to do. Uh, whenever you're tempted to smear someone, I want you to pray for them. So as soon as it comes to mind, I want to talk junk about that guy in Sunday school, or I want to talk junk about that person in my grow group. I, I, did you see so-and-so at worship? Hey, as soon as you want to bring them up and run their name in the mud, pray for them. You know what? That principle works where you work also. Right there in your workplace. Listen, quit smearing your boss and talking junk. Who are you? Are you really elevating yourself above him? You think you're greater? Listen, be be very careful. God gave you mercy. (laughs) Show mercy. Listen, hey, sir, uh, you you can't be uh, smearing your wife. You think that's going to breed unity in the family? No. Wife, you can't keep smearing your husband. Unity comes when we love each other rightly. So if you think about smearing them, pray for them. Pray for them. Here, here's the second thing. Uh, I want you to sit down sometime this week, and whenever you start making plans, I want you to consult with the Lord. Just turn your planning time into a prayer time. Amen on that. See how the Lord changes things for you. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, help us as a body walk in humility. We know we're low when we're not smearing one another. We know we're low when we are not making plans without you. And Father, how I pray for our church body that we walk in humility and experience what Jesus prayed for, unity. God, how I pray that we also would experience what the psalmist wrote about. Great joy and pleasantry as we walk together in unity. God, we want to be effective at this thing you've given us called life, this breath. We do not want to waste it.